It's been a while coming, but finally, after five years of uh, research, writing, and tortuous dealings with publishers, uh, my book, which has gone through a number of titles, uh, probably the, the most well-known at the University of Toronto Press, um, was called Ukraine Commissars into Oligarchs, um, but now it was given a different title, Ukraine Democratization, Corruption and the New Russian Imperialism by the American publisher Prager. The, um, the main reason why the book's uh, title changed was um, a consequence of shifting publishers as well as, of course, the changing landscape in Ukraine. The original idea for the book was to write something that didn't just begin in 1991, a kind of a, shall we say, a post-Soviet history of Ukraine. The reason for that being is that the more and more as time goes along since 1991, even though now we're a quarter of a century after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we still see that there's a lot of um, the Soviet legacy within contemporary Ukraine. No country, when it becomes an independent state, whether it's calendar in the mid-19th century, um, United States in the late 18th century, India after the British Empire, and of course Ukraine, particularly after the USSR, is going to start its history with a clean slate. Um, but we believed, in the 1990s at least, and maybe all the way through to the Orange Revolution, that that Soviet legacy would um, slowly begin to recede and there would be a new Ukraine emerging. We have heard over the last 20 years, for example, that the younger generation will be different. But what we have noticed is that the Soviet legacy is actually more resilient than we think in Ukraine today. And the reason, therefore, for me to begin the book, in, not in 1991, but in 1953, um, the, the book has ten chapters primarily, three chapters are a, a history of Ukraine from 1950, 1953, the year that Joseph Stalin died, and the year that historians t told me, such as Professor Robert Mogochi, that you can really talk about modern Ukraine from 1953 onwards. And that gives the sort of the background to the nine thematic chapters which deal with um, dissidents and political parties um, in the opposition in Soviet Ukraine and in post-Soviet Ukraine, nationality policies in the former Soviet Union and in independent Ukraine, the state of the economy, the um, question of rule of law corruption, which is a major chapter in the book, um, oligarchs, um, which didn't exist in the former USSR, but that is a major chapter, and of course foreign policy and defense policy. The, uh, the, the book was originally something that came to mind towards the end of the Yushchenko era, and that in particular was a disappointment to many people, both in Ukraine and the Ukrainian diaspora, the fact that we believed that the Orange Revolution and the election of Viktor Yushchenko would be a breakthrough um, in Ukraine, away from the Soviet past and towards European integration. We found that that was not to be the case. Ukrainian political leaders, even of the pro-Western democratic camp, such as Viktor Yushchenko and Yulia Tymoshenko, were nevertheless still imbued with neo-Soviet personality traits and political cultures that um, led to a very disastrous five years of Yushchenko's presidency. So by 2009-2010, the idea of a book that would integrate the 1970s and 80s, the crucial two decades prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, and let's remember that the socialization of Ukraine's elites, whether it was at the senior level, such as Leonid Krauchuk, Leonid Kuchma, um, Viktor Yanukovych, uh, 
or at the more junior level, such as in the Communist Youth League, the Komsomol, people such as Viktor Yushchenko, Sergei Tehipko, Yuli Timoshenko, Alexander Turchinov, and others, they were all socialized to varying degrees in the so-called Brezhnev era of stagnation in the 1970s and 80s. This was a very peculiar period, because it was a period of the decline of Soviet ideology, the growth of cynicism, the growth of consumerism to some degree, often illegally acquired, um, the origins of Ukraine's very large shadow economy today, which accounts for between 40 to 50 percent of the country's GDP, and that's been stable since the 1990s, has its origins in this Brezhnev era of stagnation in the 1970s and 80s, as do many of the criminal groups which were active um, in the former USSR, the so-called Vorev Zakonye. Um, these were um, organized criminal groups that had existed since the Stalin era, but particularly became very prominent in the 1970s and 80s. And that kind of more organized crime element was particularly uh, deeply embedded in places such as the Crimea, Odessa, and of course, Donetsk. Trying to deal with these legacies um, from the Soviet past uh, was difficult to combine in, in one book. Uh, the original manuscript, which would have been published by the University of Toronto Press, would have been in the region of 900 pages. This was reduced, I think, to a far more manageable size by Prager of 600 pages. Um, but there were not just problems of, um, of the size and how much information to include, there, was, there were also difficulties in what one could present even in a democratic society such as Canada. Because the problem Canada has, well, it's a problem to some degree, it's not completely a problem because Canada benefited from many ways from British rule, um, inheriting the British legal system, uh, parliamentary system, and the rule of law. But two countries where it's not very advisable if you're an author uh, to write about the criminal and corrupt pasts of politicians, for example, is both Britain and Canada. And the same thing happened to me, as happened to Karen Dewisha in Great Britain, and, and it really boils down to the same legal system where the people who are protected are the ones making the accusations of libel, not the authors who are writing their books um, in what they do believe to be a democratic society where there should be no elements of censorship. Um, Karen Dewisha wrote a very detailed account going back to the late 1980s of Vladimir Putin's links to crime and corruption. Um, and after various threats, Cambridge University Press in Great Britain tore up her contract and um, she was forced to publish in the US. The same happened with myself, uh, the American lawyers working on behalf of Renat Akhmetov, the well-known uh, Donetsk oligarch um, who was a major financier of the Party of Regions, um, requested that the manuscript be given to them by the University of Toronto Press to read over to see if there's anything libelous in there about their client, Mr. Akhmetov. This then ballooned into uh, the University of Toronto Press, suggesting that perhaps it would be good if everybody who was criticized for corruption in the book should also be permitted to take a look at what was written about them in the book. So in the words, Mr. Firtash, Mr. Yushchenko, and many, many others. Um, despite attempts by uh, Professor Mogochi to intercede and try to develop a kind of compromise that didn't happen and in the end um, like with Karen Devisha I was forced to find um, a publisher in the US and in the US very different legislation where authors are protected um, against this kind of um, attempt at censorship on the behalf of those alleging libel. Now um, the irony of all this is that uh, no, 
is that I already, already anyway had very detailed footnotes and sources to anything I was writing about, but the contract in my case was torn up during the Euromaidan when revelations about Akhmetov and other individuals surrounding Viktor Yanukovych, the then Ukrainian president, became very public. Um, it's, no, uh, it's nothing unusual today to hear um, comments made, for example, that um, close to $100 billion was stolen by the Viktor Yanukovych regime um, when it was in power between 2010 and 2014. It's not uncommon, for example, for the Minister of, Minister of Finance, Mrs. Yeresko, just to say a few weeks ago that something like 90% of the Ukrainian current debt is money stolen by the Yanukovych regime. It's not uncommon um, to hear today and to see many sources backing this up that the three groups that received the most beneficial insider um, contracts from the government and inside the privatizations were Rinat Akhmetov, Dmitro Firtash, and Alexander Yanukovych, the eldest son of the president at the time. So, in fact, the majority of the um, uh, allegations and, and, and analysis that was in my book, and is still in this current book, um, became public knowledge, and therefore it was rather unusual that the University of Toronto Press decided to ignore this massive new information coming out into the public domain uh, during the Euromaidan, and of course, even more so since then. The good side to the fact that um, um, I had to find another publisher was that Prager did a fantastic job in producing the book relatively quickly and in a very proficient and um, professional manner. They also, um, uh, because the book came out this year and not last year, that meant that I was able to cover the Euromaidan in depth and also to cover, of course, the annexation of the Crimea and the Russian-Ukrainian war in the Donbass. So all of those questions, which may have been only touched upon if the book had come out a little bit earlier, um, with the University of Toronto uh, are now covered in far more detail. For authors who wish to write about corruption and crime in any part of the world, um, it's advisable for them to not try to get published in Canada and, the U and Great Britain, but to seek an American publisher. The last thing you want is what happened to people like Karen Devisha and myself, where you spend one to two years working with a publisher on the manuscript and then the, um, then the contract is torn up and you have to start again, losing one to two years of your life um, and wasting um, a lot of time and effort. This um, will certainly be the case when I write about this kind of uh, question in the future and certainly I would, I would recommend Prager as one of, as one of the publishers that one could go down that road. The, the book um, in question, uh, I believe, is going to be useful for a number of reasons. Firstly, there isn't such a book at the moment. There isn't a book that exists which brings together the late Soviet period and the post-Soviet period, which points to the origins of questions such as Ukraine's shadow economy, very weak rule of law, um, neo-Soviet law enforcement agencies such as the prosecutor's office or the security service, um, the, the vacuous nature of Ukraine's political parties, and the Russification of a large number of Ukrainians and the regional diversity of the country. Where did all this come from? Well, met, much of this happened um, in the post-Stalin era, um, I talk about this in the context of cycles, um, talking about how Ukraine has gone through a number of cycles of history during the 20th century. If we had a cycle of national revival, 
that was always accompanied by democratization and free economic um, market, market behavior. That was certainly the case um, with the Ukraine National Revolution of 1917 to 1920. This then evolved into the National Revival and the National Communist era of the 1920s, which I, I describe as Ukraine's first cycle of history in the 20th century. This is followed by typically, as always, a, a period of counter-revolution, of, of, uh, of Russophilia, of Ukrainophobia, of destruction of Ukrainian cultural elites, of a turn towards economics, conservatism and stagnation, and of anti-democratic totalitarian tendencies. This lasts through to the early 1950s when the book picks the subject up and we have the emergence of Ukraine's third historical cycle dealing with the, the period of the where Nikita Khrushchev reveals the terrible legacy of the Stalin era and the emergence of national communist leaders such as uh, Petro Shelest in the 1960s. Then we have again a similar kind of counter-revolution, uh, conservatism and um, repression of Ukrainian descent and culture and language which begins in the pogrom of 1972, which was the worst period of repression um, against um, people in the former USSR since the Stalin era. And it led to the arrest and silencing of a huge number of Ukrainians. This lasted through to the mid-1980s, when we have the next cycle of history and the emergence of Mikhail Gorbachev, who begins to open up so-called blank pages of history, talking um, and promoting the, the, the question of de-Stalinization. Um, this leads to, in turn, a revival of, um, um, of liberalization, of, of calls for democratization, of the growth of small enterprise culture, such as cooperatives, in which members of the former Komsomol, such as Yulia Tymoshenko, and Zerhei Tihibko begin to operate, and of course, very importantly, a national revival. And I take this through um, throughout most of the Ukraine's independent um, period of history, through the first three Ukrainian presidents, Krauchuk, Kuchma, and Yushchenko, within which, yes, uh, Kuchma was more authoritarian than Krauchuk and Yushchenko, but they basically agreed on the same principles in dealing with culture and language, and they believed that Ukraine's future was in the West. The, the final um, attempt at counter-revolution and uh, repression of Ukrainian political thought and Ukrainian national culture and language came under Viktor Yanukovych, and we know how that ended very badly for him with the Euromaidan. Today we're in what should have been maybe a, an end to history. Um, it should have been the final cycle um, with Ukraine breaking through from the crossroads uh, of Asia and, uh, and Europe and moving towards European integration and democratization and national revival after following the Euromaidan, but Russia has different thoughts about that. So now we have not domestic attempts at counter-revolution, we have, like in the um, Stalin era, externally inspired counter-revolution and Ukrainophobia uh, brought in from um, Moscow. So within those cycles of history, um, I discuss uh, rule of law, corruption, oligarchs, politics, dissent, Western support for Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's attempt at integrating with the West, its attitudes towards Russia, and very importantly, the uh, reasons why it's been so tortuous for Ukraine to move along in what I've did previously described as its quadruple transition of state and institution building nation building, democratization, and marketization. The, the history is not over yet. 
um, we believed it would be with the Euromaidan, but it's not the case. And therefore, um, we need to still keep watching this spot. Thank you.